Good morning. I'd like to thank you all for coming this morning and uh, participating in our value-based leadership seminar. This is going to be the first of a series of seminars we'll be doing throughout the year. I especially want to welcome our visitors from Clark County High School. I'm really happy that you're here. Thank you, Leona, for bringing your students. Um, I'd like to introduce Joe Marshall. Joe was one of the founders of Sintagleshka University back in 1970 and 71, and he's one of the very first Lakota language teachers on this reservation. He and Victor DeVille and Albert Whitehat, I believe, were the first three Lakota studies instructors on this reservation. Um, Joe has gone on and written some fantastic literature, Lakota literature, based on the stories of our people, based on our place. And we really believe that um, when we have those kinds of stories, then we are always going to continue who we are as tribal people. Now I'll give you Joe to present the value-based leadership, and I think probably some of you have read some of his stories. Uh, he was selected as a author of the year for uh, One Book, South Dakota. Uh, he's written The Journey of Crazy Horse. He's done significant research into leadership styles of Lakota leaders, as well as non-Lakota leaders. And uh, I think you'll all really gain a lot from this workshop. Joe. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm glad you're here. We're in Lakota, we said, Daya Hipelo. Good of you to come. Uh, but I, wanna, I want to make something really, really clear right from the beginning. Um, I'm glad you're interested in this topic because leadership is an issue that we all should be paying attention to no matter who we are no matter what we do no matter how old we are because leadership or the lack of it affects us all whether we know it or not and right now there's all kinds of talking heads on tv after our votes because they want to be our leaders they certainly are our politicians and they're sweet talkers, but whether or not they're really, really leaders is what you need to decide, what we all need to decide. But the one point I want to make clear with you is, <clears throat> as Sherry said, uh, I've done some research into this whole topic of leadership over the years, not just last week, over a long time, long period of time. But I'm not an expert on anything. So you need to understand that. I'm not up here because I'm an authority or an expert on leadership or anything else. What I am and what I hope all of you will be over time is an observer. To have an awareness of what is going on around you and in your life, no matter your age. Because sometimes the things that you don't pay attention to or that slip by your awareness are going to cause some consequence for you. <coughs> I accepted Sherry's invitation to do this workshop, workshop because... <laughs> I care about leadership, I care about what happens to us as individuals and as Lakota people and as Native people. So uh, with that we'll get started. If you don't have something to write with, let us know. We have paper up here and a few pens and I'm going to ask you to take notes and there is one thing I'll ask you to do specifically. So. Uh, if you don't have anything to write with, let us know, or borrow something from somebody. And if you have 
if you have a question, there's some pens up here and some paper. Could you pass this back to that lady back there? Right there. There's a pen. There's some paper here. You need some paper? Just, okay, help yourself. Help yourself. Run in. Okay, are we all set? Okay. Well, I'm under the gun because somebody here said I better do a good job or I don't get any banana bread. <laughs> I won't say who. So I'm going to try. What we're going to talk about is the, the broad topic of leadership and we're going to focus on Lakota leadership and how that can relate to here and now. I want you to take a really, really good look at this quote. I used to live in Wyoming and I would write a daily col or a monthly column for the Casper Star Tribune, several people did. And an individual, a man, this was the opening sentence of his column back in 1995 or 96. I wish I would have said this. The greatest arrogance of the present is to forget the intelligence of the past. The greatest arrogance of the present right now, we hear, our greatest arrogance is sometimes we forget about the past. We don't give much credit to those who've gone before us. You agree with that? Do you care? You think about it every now and then? When you stop to think about it, our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, as far back as you can go, had to contend with the same kinds of things that we worry about now. The broad issue of how to make a living, where to live, how to raise our children, how to function in a society or a family. They, they contended with those same issues that we have today. So what's the difference between them and us? Our gadgets, our technology. And as time goes on, we get more and more and more stuff. So because we have all of those superficial, artificial things, we think we're smart. And we probably are. People, I mean, not all of us have invented anything, but someone has. And we buy into it. We think, this is really cool. We we're pretty smart people. And we tend to look down on somebody who didn't have those things. That's a big mistake. A very big mistake. So I hope you don't do that. I hope that doesn't become a part of your thinking. Because our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, our great-great-great-grandparents, as far back as you can go, lived their lives worrying about dealing with the same issues, same kinds of issues we do today. So that's what this means. We can't forget them. They were just as intelligent. They were just as creative. They were just as knowledgeable. And probably in some respects wiser than we are now. So please don't ever forget that. So what we're going to do in this course is very simple. There's nothing complicated about it. And you're aware this is an all day thing. We're going to start now, and we're going to try to finish around 3 o'clock. Depends on how fast I talk. 
and how well you listen. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a look at a non-mainstream perspective on leadership. And the mainstream I'm talking about is uh, your American approaches to things. To put it bluntly, the white mainstream society. We're going to talk about them a little bit, but we're, 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 what we're going to focus on is a Lakota perspective or perspectives on leadership. And then we're going to, in, in order to do that, we have to look back into the past. There's a question that you've, some of you have heard me ask before. It's a question I like to ask. So I'm going to ask you uh, three questions. How old is the present moment? How old is now? Can you measure it? Can you quantify it? Can you say it's this old? Whether it's one-tenth of a second, or a millisecond, or one-hundredth of a second? We can't, can we? It's here and gone. How old is the future? Doesn't ha hasn't happened yet, has it? So we can't measure it. How old is the past? Yeah, as far back as you want to go. The answer is it's really, really old. <laughs> so there are some of the answers to what we do today, some of the questions, some of the problems that we face. The answers are in the past. So sometimes we need to look back. So that's what we're going to do. And then we're going to take a look at a person from the past who was a proven leader. And his name is Tashunka Witko. Crazy horse. Or more precisely, his crazy horse. In the translation, we, we tend to omit the precise translation. Tashunke Witko means his crazy horse. So we're going to take a look at him. We're not going to study him to any dip, but we're going to look at pieces of his life, some of the things he did, why he did, and, and how he got to be the kind of person and the kind of leader he was. Okay? Again, any time is a good question, to, I mean, a good time to ask a question. I will not guarantee you any sensible answers, but you sure can ask a question. So, here's what I want you to do. That's why I, I want to make sure you have something to write with. Take a couple minutes and write down your definition of leadership. What you think or what you know it is. Write it down for me because we're going to go back to it. What is leadership? What do you know? What do you think leadership is? Define it for me. There's some open seats over here if you want to come down. Anyway, there's a few. This doesn't have to be an essay, just a simple definition. <laughs> Limit it to at least half a page, if you can. Okay, thank you for doing that. We're going to go back to it, as I said. <coughs> Leadership 
is defined and exercised by every culture anywhere, all over the world, right now. How many countries are there in the world? How many cultures are there in the world? Hundreds, hundreds of them. Hundreds of nations, hundreds of societies on every continent. And every one of them has their own definition, has their own idea, has their own approach to leadership. Since human, human people, human beings began to organize themselves into groups, leadership was an issue. And we're, we as Lakota people, we are here on this reservation and, and, and anywhere, it, it was an issue with us too. People are big, anthropologists, if you know what those kind of people are, they, they study human societies, sociologists, historians. Those kind of people are kind of cautiously saying that maybe there was as many as 20,000 different native tribes, and indigenous tribes in North America. North America being Mexico, United States, and Canada. Imagine that. That's pretty cool. I tend to believe it. Up to 1492 or thereabouts, and then after that we begin to decline. <coughs> and so our people were one of them. Our nation of Lakota, Dakota, and, and Lakota people is older than the United States of America. And they had they evolved leadership, they developed leadership, they had concepts of leadership. And that's sort of what we're going to look at today. As I said, we're going to take a look at this man, Kashunkawitko. This is an artist's conception of what, what he might have looked like. Um, there's, there's, it's not bad. Uh, it depicts some of his his medicine symbols, if you will, the hailstones, the lightning uh, on his horse. Sometimes he painted that on his body as well. And uh, there are two things wrong with this. However, I like I like it. It's a it's a nice image. There are two things wrong with it. He never ever wore an eagle feather in his hair. He did wear a red hawk feather, or half the body of a dried red-tailed hawk. And the other inaccuracy is the, the iron bit in the horse's mouth. We Lakota did not use iron bits. We used a simple, what's called a jaw rope, just a leather thong through the bottom and maybe a head stall, that was it. But nothing iron, nothing metal. Other than that, this is a cool, cool picture. We won't delve into it much. We're going to talk about Crazy Horse as a man and as a leader. And the other thing that he was, was a thunder dreamer. Oheoka. And what is a thunder dreamer? Somebody who literally dreams about thunder. And when he was a boy, he had a dream. There was thunder in it, thunder and lightning. And his dream was this. It, it, it wasn't a vision. He didn't go through the protocol of having a humbleche or a vision quest. He didn't do that. He was alone by himself when he was a teenager. After having witnessed a, a very traumatic event, he went out by himself and spent a couple of days alone. And he had a dream, just like we all do when we sleep sometimes. Except for my brothers-in-law. For some reason, they'd never dream. I mean, that's a whole other issue. Crazy Horse, is, at the time he wasn't named Crazy Horse, he was Gigi or Light Hair, he was a young teenager. And the predominant story of the dream is this, that he was, he saw a lake, a long flat lake, and behind it in the distance were some mountain ridges. And above the mountain ridges were these thunder clouds, like we get around here in the summer. Big cumulus thunder clouds and there was lightning, and he could hear a rumble of thunder. 
and above the lake was circling a red-backed hawk or a red-tailed hawk. And out of the lake, out of the water, comes this man, explodes this man on a horse with long hair. Obviously a Lakota man. And he gallops, he and the horse gallop across on the surface of the lake. And as he's galloping, the horse changes color from white to red to black to blue and so forth. As he's galloping. And some unseen enemies are shooting bows and arrows or arrows and guns at him. But he doesn't get hit. And when he reaches the shore, out of the earth materialize these men that look like him, that look like the rider. And they stop the horse, they surround him, and they reach up and they pull him down from his horse. That was his dream. It wasn't a vision. It's a dream. Very, very vivid dream. He didn't tell his father, who was a medicine man, about it for a year or so. He didn't want to talk about it right away. I don't know why. Maybe he thought it wasn't important, but it bothered him, so eventually he told his dad about it. But we'll go back to that dream later on. But this is an image of Crazy Horse. That might have been what he looked like. Anyway, the descriptions of Crazy Horse are, he, uh, he doesn't look like the mountain in the Black Hills. Not even close. This is not a criticism of the mountain or the project. The physical descriptions that, that, that prevails is that he was probably around six feet tall and slender. He had dark brown hair. Uh, he and his sister, he and his older sister had lighter skin and dark brown hair. Uh, probably because of a medical condition, I forget what it's called, but it's two or three steps down from albinism, you know, where people have really entirely white skins and pink or red eyes and even white hair. But hit, that condition shows up in, only in dark skin races, where people just have lighter skin, lighter hair. That's all it was. And historians really jump on that, saying he was part Washichu. That's not true. So, so he had a narrow face, long narrow nose, and a wide mouth, and really, really intense dark eyes. So that's probably what he looked like. That's a description I heard a lot from several different people. And that's typically the, the appearance of many Lakota males. So anyway, I thought you'd like this image. <coughs> so, as I said before, this seminar is based partially on him and what he did. But don't get the idea, I'm not trying to say that he was a perfect person. He was a real person. He was not a mythological hero that somebody made up. He was a real person. He actually lived. Not very long, but he lived. And he was a reluctant leader. Didn't want to be a leader. So we're going to take a look at what he did, how he lived his life, and glean some lessons on leadership from that. So we'll just do a real quick sort of a bio biographical study. Uh, he was born somewhere 1840 on. We don't know exactly when. Because obviously there were no birth certificates. We didn't use the Gregorian calendar, the Washichu calendar, or our ancestors didn't. Interestingly enough, one winter count uh, that was kept by some of his extended family uh, describes the year that he was born as the winter a hundred horses were taken. And Lakota warriors raided Shoshone people in, in up there in Wyoming and took a hundred horses. Or as they like to say, they were keeping our horses so we went and got them back. But that's, we don't know exactly when he was born. His father was probably Oglala, his mom Minikanju, two of the Lakota bands. That's not unusual. My dad is Oglala, my mom is Sichahu. Uh, he was a second child, he had an older sister. His father was a healer, 
medicine man, a traditional healer. And his name was Crazy Horse. His father's name was Crazy Horse. He was the second in his family to have the name. His mother died when he was four. Some of the stories, stories suggest that she might have uh, killed herself. It might have been a suicide. But of course, it, it affected him. It affected him and his sister, younger sister. Just to have a parent die. That in itself is traumatic enough. So he grew up a loner. His father eventually remarried two Sichangu women, two sisters. And as a boy, he was tutored by the older males in his family. And in his case, a family friend by the name of Hump. A high backbone. He was a Manukanju Lakota who liked Crazy Horse, took a liking to him. And they were friends all their lives until Hump was killed on a raid into Shoshone territory. And those tutors, those teachers, those mentors taught every boy, not just Crazy Horse, but all the boys. And girls, too. This worked for the girls as well. The girls are taught by the women in the family. The moms, the aunties, the grandmas, and friends of the family. The skills they had to learn to be the focal point of, of the family. Because women were the focal point of the family. So the women taught the girls and the men taught the boys. That's how it worked. That was our educational system. It was very effective. It wasn't just physical skills they were taught. They were taught the values, the norms, the philosophies of being Lakota, of functioning within that society. And this education continued until about the age of 17 or 18. For the boys, they were taught to be hunters and warriors. To learn the skills to do that. How to make their own bows and arrows. How to fight hand-to-hand -hand combat. How to trail, track people. All those things. And Crazy Horse, like any other boy of the time, went through the same thing. And as a teenager, one of the things that really endeared him to other people, and because of the values he learned from his parents and grandparents, and his uncles and aunts, he would go out and hunt and bring meat home for elders and widows. He wouldn't t tell anybody. He would just bring a deer home or an elk and lay it on somebody's doorstep and walk away, not even wait to be thanked. So people like that. So that was, that, was, that was a side of him that we all don't know. We think of him as a warrior, as a fighting man. But he was a lot more than that. That was only part of what he was. So remember that when you, talk, when you think about him as a leader. He was well known for his being respectful of his elders. Very courteous, very respectful of, of all his elders, no matter who they were. As were most people, as were most young people in those days. But he certainly was. And he was a very quiet and shy person. Painfully shy, as a matter of fact. Even when he rose to prominence as a leader and had a status in the community and was expected to participate, he only spoke in public three times in his life. You know, other people like to talk. Not him. He was very shy, very quiet. Very humble. So, <clears throat> after he is involved in his first military excursion, where there is a fight between Lakota and Shoshone, and where Crazy Horse is nicked by a bullet, his father gives him the name Crazy Horse. And again, the name came... Oops. What's happening here? Oh, here we go. His father was the second in the family to have the name Crazy Horse. He got it from his dad. So the Crazy Horse we're talking about today, Tashunka Witko, was the third male in his family to have the name. We don't know how the name originated, why, why it was given to his grandfather. 
but it was inherited by Crazy Horse after his first combat experience. And <clears throat> interestingly enough, after his father gave his name away, he took the name Wagalula. Anybody know what the word Wagalula means? Worm. Took a very lowly, very humble name, Wagalula. Interesting man. He had a girlfriend. He liked a girl. They grew up together. They wanted to marry. But while Crazy Horse was away with his younger brother on a military excursion into what is now Montana against the Crow, she was married off to someone else. Her name was Black Buffalo Woman. And that broke his heart, needless to say. So he went off and spent some time by himself because of this. And he was very angry over it. But by that time, he was, he was beginning to be a very proven fighting man. He and his younger brother, Little Hawk, who was, who was the, the son of one of his, what we now call stepmoms. But in those days, there was no such thing as a stepmom. They were just moms. So he was earning, earning a reputation as a, as a warrior, and many times he was asked to lead as a warrior, which he really didn't want to do. He thought that responsibility should go to somebody who was older and more experienced. He didn't realize that he was gaining a lot of experience, which is why people were turning to him. And he was a shirt man. We'll talk more about what a shirt man is later on in more detail, but it's, it's a status that, that's very prestigious in Lakota society. It wasn't given to just anybody. And later on, he agreed to an arranged marriage to a woman named Black Shawl, and they had a daughter together. Unfortunately, she died three or four of cholera, so she didn't live very long. And that broke his heart, too. They say he spent days by her burial scaffold crying for his daughter. And as he began to take charge and be a war party leader, as it were, to lead military excursions and patrols, and, and then later on battles, like the Battle of the Hundred and Han, or the Greasy Grass, and other encounters with Washichus and other Native people, where he was the primary leader, where he was the main guy in charge, he never lost a battle. Never, ever. And he and Sitting Bull were the last to surrender. By 1865, 66, <laughs> most of the Lakota were already on reservations in northwest Nebraska. In those days, they were called agencies. They were all already living under the control of white people except for Crazy Horse's band and Sitting Bull's band. They were the last to surrender. Crazy Horse surrendered in 1877. Sitting Bull surrendered in, I think, 1881. So Sitting Bull was the last to surrender. A lot of spaces over here. I'm sure somebody will move, hopefully. Just dive, dive. Yeah, just dive over. <laughs> yeah. We'll look the other way if you want to dive over. <laughs> and of course, Crazy Horse was killed at Fort Robinson, Nebraska on September 5th, 1877. He wasn't very old, not even 40. And again, we don't know when he was born, so he was probably 35, 36, 37, somewhere near. The usual age for Lakota men to rise to the level of leadership that he had was about 40. So in that sense, you can assume he was an extraordinary person, an extraordinary leader to have acquired that leadership status at a very young age, beginning in his early 20s. So that's why he's one of my heroes, and that's why I decided to, to take a really good look at the stories that talk about his leadership. Because there's a lesson in there for all of us that we can use today. 
So that's why he's the focal point of this, one of the focal points of this seminar. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, his first adult name was Tashunka Otai Naji. His horse stands in sight. Thanks for reminding me. His horse stands in sight because after a f first couple of encounters, excursions against the crow, um, he did a, maybe not a strange thing, but did a brave thing. All he had was, he had a six, a pistol, a six shot pistol. And in those days it was cap and ball pistol. The guns were hard to get. We couldn't just go down to Walmart or Cabela's and say, I want this firearm. They had to be traded for or stolen or however. And even if you had a gun, it didn't mean you always had the powder and a shot. So he had bows and arrows. So in one of his first encounters against the crow, he did something that earned him his name. <coughs> Lakota warriors would wear a long rope that they wound around their waist. And it was, there was a neck rope around the horse. That sketch doesn't show you what a neck rope is. It's around the horse's neck and over his girth. And it's tightened, it's sort of like a cinch, but it's a small braided rope. And that long cord from the, around the warrior's waist is, waist is slid under the, that neck rope and then around the horse's nose. So that if the warrior fell off in battle, the horse was trained to drag him away to safety. Those war horses were very highly trained. So what he did during that particular encounter was he jumped off his horse, uncurled, undid, the, unwind the, the thing around his waist, and he walked away from his horse so that his horse wouldn't get hit by bullets or arrows. And he knelt down and took deliberate aim at the oncoming enemy. So that's how he earned his first adult name. His horse stands in sight. Cool, huh? You ever seen a map like this? I mean, you've seen North America. Obviously, you've seen maps of North America. This is, this map with the different colors of different areas are what sociologists and historians and anthropologists say when they study the pre-European people, us, our ancestors of North America. They, they label it culture areas. And rightly so. Because there are things different about these areas. They're, they're not all the same, obviously. From way up north in the Arctic to the subarctic, of course, what's the big thing about the Arctic and the subarctic? Cold and snow. Cold and snow. Different kind of animals. Winter stays a long time, about eight months out of the year. Then you get down into the northwest coast. People lived along the ocean. It was, it was kind of rough terrain. It's not all sandy beaches. And those people who lived along, along the coast, some of them made skin boats and went out on the ocean to hunt whales. Just like our people hunted buffalo, they hunted whales. And then the people in the southwest, they're the ones that built the cliff dwellings. And they learned about irrigation, and they lived in the desert. Totally different. And so now here we are on the plains. On the east, in the northeast and southeast, it's all forest. Heavy forest. So those people, their villages stayed in one place. Or sedentary, the word is sedentary. You stay and you have permanent villages in one place because the forest prevented movement. But in, in our part of the world, it's wide open, isn't it? So there was an animal that lived here that moved, the bison, the buffalo. So in order to harvest the buffalo and live off it for our food, shelter, and clothing, clothing, we had to move with the buffalo. So we became nomadic. We moved our villages a lot. So. The, the land itself, the natural environment, really dictated the kind of lifestyle that native North Americans lived. So that's why I want to show you this map. Because our, all of our, we think there's one kind of Indian culture, there isn't. And the reason that we're all different from each other, all those 500 to 2,000 tribes, is because of the land itself. 
the people up in the Arctic and subarctic, sometimes they would have to live under the snow with igloos and some of them wouldn't see sunlight for months at a time, weeks at a time. They would have igloos and they'd have little tunnels under the snow that they could walk under. They had to survive the best way they could with what was there. That's what we all did. All of us, no matter where we lived. So that's why I wanted to show you this map. And why we are who we are because we're nomadic. We moved our villages. We were hunters. We chased the game. We chased the bison. We chased the deer, the elk, and so forth. We moved our villages, had big, high teepees. And at one time, we controlled a big territory. And this is a fair approximation of, of the area that we controlled at one time. As you can see, it encompasses all of South Dakota and parts of other states around us. And at the time, up to about 1850, 1850, it, this area was bigger than most European countries at the time. Now, there weren't hard and fast borders like there are now like the border between South Dakota and Nebraska, or South Dakota and North Dakota. Nothing was there that's artificial. The borders depended on how much territory we could control. And we can control all this territory because our population was very, very large for the time. The average size of native tribes anywhere in North America was just a few hundred. Four, five, six, seven hundred maybe 2,000. Our people, Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota, probably were about 20, 25,000, around 1850. So we were one of the really large tribes. So that enabled us to control this much territory. It wasn't because we were imperialistic. What does imperialistic means? mean? It means someone who takes land, just for the sake of taking land because they can. We weren't that way. We controlled the resources that we needed to survive and thrive as a people. We didn't go in and kill people off because they were in our way. When we began moving west, further west into Wyoming, the coal people were there. But they saw how many we were eventually, so they just moved out of the way. We didn't have pitched battles and, and kill them off because we wanted their land. White historians will lead you to believe that's what happened because that's what happened in Europe. They think it happened here in North America. It didn't. Not the way that it happened in Europe. So I just want, that's the reason for this map. We control a very large territory. One of the reasons why is because we were strong people. And pardon my language, we didn't take any shit from anybody. That doesn't mean we were mean. We just stuck up for ourselves. Because we could. So, <clears throat> why is there such a thing as leadership? Why is leadership necessary? How did it start? It had to start somewhere, right? I mean, if you recall from from your elementary days on a school ground, maybe on a playground, there was always someone, usually some guy, who was a little bit stronger, a little bit louder than everybody else, who wanted to be in control of the moment. That's a human trait. That's what we all do as human beings, no matter who we are, no matter what our culture is. But one of the basic reasons for leadership is survival. Imagine a time when everybody was a hunter or a gatherer, And all you had, all you needed, to, well, basically what you needed to worry about was enough food, safety, and shelter. And however you acquired those, it was easier if you did it as a group. People could survive individually, but groups working together, it was easier for people to find the things they needed to live day in and day out. So that was the reason for, survive, or for leadership. Just pure survival. Um, as I said, at some point, somebody or a group of people wanted to take control. We want to be in charge. We want to tell people what to do. We want to tell them where to go to hunt. 
where they find the water, all those things. Somebody thought the concept of control would work very well. And mainly to acquire the materials and resources and territory we needed to live and get people to work together. That's what leadership does. We get people to work together, even way back when, to accomplish what we needed to accomplish. So that's, that's how leadership, the concept, the idea of leadership likely started. And how do we enable leadership? How did we start doing that? Because the group allows it. If the guy on a playground who's bigger and louder than anybody else tells you to do something and he influences four or five kids and they say, oh, that's okay, and they go along with him, that's group consent. We do that all the time. We agree to the leadership. We agree to the person in charge. We agree to how leadership is done today. Or acquiescence. What's acquiescence? Pardon me? No? What's acquiescence? You allow it to happen. Does that necessarily mean you do something or you could just, you could or you could just sit back and allow it to happen. That's acquiescence. Or inaction. Even if we don't go out and vote, some leaders are going to be elected. If you don't participate, things are still going to happen. So inaction has an effect too. The wrong kind of people could get into quote-unquote leadership positions. And legislation today, Congresses, state legislatures enact laws to enable authority, leadership. And leadership happens because sometimes there's a fear of retribution. The playground guy says, either you do this for me, I'm going to kick you, kick you butt. Or I'm going to bounce a rock off your head. So you're afraid of that. And retribution comes in other forms as well. We're afraid of losing our jobs. Or not getting something we want. Or getting something else taken away from us. That's retribution. And charisma. Leadership happens because of charisma. Does Donald Trump have charisma? Does Bernie Sanders have charisma? Have you studied Adolf Hitler in history? Do we all know who Adolf Hitler is? He was a leader of Germany. He was the chancellor. He worked himself up by hook or by crook into a leadership position. And he convinced a whole nation of 8 million people that what he stood for, the way he wanted to do things, was the right way to do it. He built them up because he said, everybody is against us, and we have that right as Aryan people to be the best that we can be to have everything. And the way he did it was with charisma. He would get up in front of people, because at least were the days of radio, was just radio, and talk for hours and hours and hours. And people didn't watch him on TV. They listened to him on the radio, or they would fill these big city squares. Thousands and thousands and thousands of them came to listen to what he had to say because he was charismatic. Just with words and his delivery, everybody bought into what he was saying. That's charisma. Got to be careful of people with charisma, though. In the end, was what he was talking about, what he wanted to do, what he was espousing, was it a good thing? No. He did some really bad things. But he was a charismatic leader, wasn't he? He sure was. So charisma can cut either way. 
And the other way that leadership is enabled is ruthlessness. You know what a dictator is? Yep. What about President Assad in Syria? He's a leader, isn't he? He's a, he's a dictator. And he's one that, is, as far as I'm concerned, espouses ruthlessness. Because he will take any means necessary to make sure he is obeyed. That he gets what he wants. Whether it's good for the people or not. So these are all the ways in which leadership is enabled. This is the way, these are the ways leadership happens. It's happening all, all around us, even now. It has, has happened throughout history. It's happening now. All we have to do is pay attention to what goes on around us. And you'll see all these things happening. Now, for us, pre-reservation day, I mean, by pre-reservation, pre I mean before 1860, before 1865. Because as I said earlier, by then, by 18, the mid-1860s, most of the Lakota had surrendered to white authority and were living in northwest Nebraska, in and around Fort Robinson, Nebraska. Anybody been to Fort Robinson, Nebraska? If you haven't, you should go. It's important for a lot of reasons. Because of what I just said, all the, most of the Lakota were there living on agencies. There were villages to the west of, east of Fort Robinson, there were villages to the west. But they were all living under white authority, under white control. And that's where Crazy Horse was killed. There are the museums there, the, the, the place, the site, the building where he was killed, where they tried to put him in jail, that's been reconstructed. So it's there. And the spot where they believe he fell after he was stabbed by a soldier with a bayonet, there's a stone monument there. So if you can at all, there, there's some, some places you should visit, if you can in your lifetime, sooner rather than later. To help you get a sense of who you are and where you come from, that's one of them. Um, but we were, we were so pre-reservation, we, we lived in tight-knit communities. There could be more than one Teoshpaya in a village, but the Teoshpaya was the basic unit. People who are related, a community, extended families. Uh, and it was important because everybody knew everybody else. It could be a bad thing, too. Could be a bad thing too. But everybody knew everybody else. But the individual choice was very, very important. Everybody was free to choose, pick what they wanted to do, when they wanted to do it. That was very, very important. So how out of that did we have the kind of leaders like Sitting Bull, like Spotted Tail, like Swift Bear, like Milk, like Crazy Horse, all those people, how did, how did they come out of that system if individual choice was more important? Well, that's what we're going to talk about. See how that happened. It started with, it started very simply actually. Look in the lower right hand corner, the word family even though it's upside down. Started with a family in the home, the immediate family, and, and to a certain extent, the extended family. The moms, the dads, the grandmas, the grandpas, uncles and aunts, and all the relatives. That was family. And, and they, like today, but even more so then, they had a direct impact on how kids were raised. Uncles and aunts had a big say about how kids were raised. They really did. So that's where the influence started. There are stories that say that one, that the women were the first teachers of all, all kids in the old days, up until the age of five or six. That's when the boys 
broke away, were taught by their, their dads, their uncles, their grandpas. But when a male child was born, you guys sure you don't want to sit over here? It's probably more comfortable. You okay? All right. When a male child was born, the father would give a gift. Any child was born, but especially when a male child, the father would give a gift to his wife. Could be a horse, could be anything. To acknowledge the pain that she had to go through to give birth. And for a male child, he would say to her, to his mother, to whoever else was the female members of the family, the aunts and the grandmas, he would say, he's yours for the first five years of his life. So the moms, the aunts, the grandmas were the first influence on all children, and especially boys. They were the first teachers. And they never stopped having that influence all, you know, for, for, for all children, for all people. And then after that, it was the rest of the community. Because people, remember, people lived in small villages. Small towns, essentially. Everybody knew everybody. And they all had a say, had an impact, had a role in how a child behaved, what they were taught. So Crazy Horse went through this process, like anybody else. And beyond that was the band. Whether it was the Oglala Lakota band, Sichangu Hunkpapa, Itazipa Chola Mnikanju, Ohe Nupe, or Sihasapa. How many bands of Lakota are there? Seven. Seven. And then the whole nation as a whole. That was the influence on everybody. Of course, a child wasn't aware of that at first, but as he got older and became a part of the community and took his place as a young adult, then he became more and more aware of this process. And the reason I put this in a circle is because that's how it works. It starts with the family, goes around to the entire nation, and goes back to the family. And circles are important to us, aren't they? In our culture. Everything works in a circle. Everything. Our lives work in a circle. The seasons work in a circle. So that's why I put this graph up there as a circle. So that's how, this is how hopefully some of us today are still influenced. I really hope so. But it certainly was the case in Crazy Horse's lifetime. And this is how a society, this is how a nation thrives because of this kind of influence. It starts in the home. It starts with the parents. It starts with the grandmas and grandpas, the uncles and the aunties. What they believe in, what they know, all impacts the child, boy or girl. The one thing that I remember from my childhood, a lot of things I remember, one of the first things I remember is my grandma, my maternal grandmother, Annie Tuhog, teaching me how to pray. Probably when I was four years old or so. And I, and I kind of remember her being a little frustrated because I wouldn't pay attention. But she was the one who taught me how to pray. So, she, you know, her influence starts from that. So let's take a look at <clears throat> the leadership hierarchy among the Lakota. And it was the same for the Nakota and Dakota. We're talking about the Lakota societies. I put the old men at the top, the old people, because they were ultimately responsible. And below them comes the medicine man, the Wapay Wachasha, that's how some people call him. Medicine man is, is kind of a misleading term in English. I, I, I tend to think of medicine men as today like a cross between a pastor and a doctor. Because they do both. 
They work with the spirit world and they heal people with medicine, with herbs, with ceremony. But they were influential. The old guys, and some of the old guys were medicine men, but the council would look to them for advice, insight, guidance, all those things. And then below them were two kinds of leaders. The civilian leaders, meaning the non-military leaders, and the military leaders, or the Zuya Itchansha. Zuya means conflict or war. Were we, do you think, were we in a constant state of war in the old days? No. What was the one thing that took up people's, most of their time? Surviving. Making a living. What did we need to have a good living in those days? Shelter, certainly, right? Clothing? Security? Yeah. Land, water? Yeah. Food? Yeah, all those things. So how did we acquire those things? How did we acquire food? How did we make our shelters? We, we went out and got it somehow. The average family in those days probably, once, once we came onto the plains and our families got bigger because of the horse, the average family probably needed somewhere between 50 and 100 pounds of meat a year. That's a lot of hunting, isn't it? And how many hides did it make to take a, bo a, a teepee? Anywhere from 16 to 20 some, depending on how. And for all, anybody that's butchered a buffalo or tanned a buffalo hide, you know how much work that is. A lot of work. And the women did that. But somebody had to go out and get that stuff, right? Somebody had to go out and hunt the buffalo or the deer or the elk. And that was a man's job. The man as the hunter. The man fulfilled two roles. The hunter, the provider, and the warrior, the protector. So which of those endeavors did he spend most of his time doing? Hunting. The hunting. Probably 75% of his time was spent procuring the materials to make a living for his, to provide for his family. So that didn't leave much time for war, did it? And it was necessary to protect ourselves sometimes. Enemies were all around us. So it was necessary for the warrior to function, to be taught, and to take its place and do warrior stuff, as it were. But people like to say, describe us as a warlike society, a warlike people. Why did they, why did they say that, do you suppose? When Washitus were coming west, especially during the Oregon Trail days from the mid-1840s to the late 1860s, who was the first person they saw? Native people. The man. The man as a protector. Who wasn't pleased that they were coming. So he probably wasn't smiling at them. Probably had a weapon in his hand of some kind. And a scowl on his face. So that was their first impression by and large. So guess what they're going to say? These guys are mean. These guys are warlike. They'd rather kill us than look at us. And guess what gets into the history books? That kind of stuff. But we were not warlike. We were not mean spirit. Well, except for my brothers-in-law. And they're, they're strange. I'll tell you about my brothers-in-law later. And then at, at the bottom are the warrior societies. We tell them in each year is one way to describe them. Warrior society. Now there's a lot of warrior societies. And they were important. They were important in the development of men, young men. And they were important in, the develop, in, in, in how society, how a village was defended and protected. So this is the basic hierarchy. And we're going to talk more about this.
we're going to get into the details. Doing okay so far? I don't see anybody sleeping, so I think we're all on the same page. Except for that person in the corner back there. You're awake, okay. So let's start at the bottom and mention warrior societies. And each of them espoused a code of conduct or principle. Whatever that was. To set themselves apart from all the other societies. And they often, when they went out on military excursions or they would prepare for battle, they would sometimes paint their horses all the same. So everybody would know they were a member of this particular society or so. Individually, warriors did paint their horses. But sometimes if they're a member of a society, they all painted their horses the same. And the societies were controlled by older men. And usually they had a specific number in it, like 20 or 12 or 16 or 32. Had a specific number. Interestingly enough, always divisible by four. What do you suppose that is? Hmm? Waka. Four is a sacred number. So these older men taught the younger men. <clears throat> they turned them into better fighters. They taught them, they refined their skills, their combat skills. They taught them how to fight from the back of a horse. They taught them how to fight on horse uh, 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 from the ground. But they also taught them the philosophy of being a warrior. And overall, being a warrior was not being a killer. Being a warrior was being a defender, a protector, especially of the helpless ones. That's what a warrior did. So when somebody tells you that Lakota males, especially, live for war, no. We don't live for, nobody likes war. Ask anybody who's been in it. Ask anybody who's been in combat. It's not, a, it's not a good thing. Nobody likes that. Nobody looks forward to that. You'd be stupid if you did. But we did live to protect our own. That's what a warrior was about. So that's what they were taught. The philosophy of the warrior. How to improve that. There was another way of looking at that. Overall, men, young men, Older men were taught that you need to live the rest of your life working to be a complete man. You hear that phrase every now and then on TV, to be the best that you can be. That's one way of looking at it. To be a good man, to be a complete man. Take care of your family, take care of your family, your community. Do your job well. More societies taught them that. There were a few hunting societies as well. And we're talking about warrior societies. Let me remind, remind you, anytime you have a question, speak up. Jump up and down, do cartwheels, whatever. <clears throat> Let's talk about the civilian leaders. Hopefully, what I'm describing to you now, my intent is to dispel the myth of the chief. There were men, in, and we'll talk about later, in control of certain situations for a duration of time, but there was not one man who was an overall authority over everybody all the time. Again, that's a myth from the Washichu side of the story. Because that's the way they did things. <clears throat> Civilian leaders were those men who led in non-military situations. Usually a big buffalo hunt. Usually when the villages were moving from one place to the next. And this is important because we are a nomadic society. We moved our villages a lot. In a village of 100, 
a village of 400, it's not easy to move all that stuff and all those people. It was a very deliberate process. Starting from when the new site had to be picked out by the medicine men, and there were ceremonies that went with that. And then the day was appointed, okay, we're going to move in four days so everybody could prepare. And then the teepees were struck down, everything was folded and packed on travel poles, and out they went whether it was 15 or 20 miles. They were vulnerable during that move. So there was a person or persons in charge of situations like that to ensure the safety and well-being of the people. Or even on a hunt. A lot of the hunting was done individually by the hunters, by men. But sometimes there was a really exciting communal hunt that you've seen in paintings and you saw a, a funny version of it in Dances with Wolves. That's what I'm talking about. So somebody had to organize that. Somebody had to set rules. And it was the civilian leader's job to do that. And when the time came, he did that. And when the event was over, that was it. He did his job and it was over. Until the next time. And sometimes they would arb be arbitrators. They would listen to disputes between individuals or between families. Sort of like a judge. And usually they were 40 years or older. Because at that point you had to have some experience, some knowledge, some insight. And that's always a good thing. So this is what a civilian leader was all, civilian leader was all about. Zuyawicha, <clears throat> Zuyaitancha. And you had to have earned this status. You couldn't get, wake up one day and say, well, today I'm going to go out and lead a war party. You could if you earned that status. You had to achieve that. And you gain it, gain it through experience. So a war leader, a war party leader, a military leader took charge in these situations. As far as you know, from what you've heard, maybe from other sources, read in books, did we as Lakota people in the old days have a standing army? You think? No, we didn't. We didn't. But basically, every male 17 and older or thereabouts was a fighting man. He'd been trained to be that. So he was always available. But do we have an army like we do today in, in the United States? No. It went that way. At all. So whenever there was a need to defend the village, the camp, whatever, or to, and, and one important thing they did was they, they deployed scouts. These men took charge. And again, they were experienced people. They learned their craft. They learned to be leaders under the tutelage of other people, other leaders. And when their time came, they took over. But... <clears throat> And, and usually they belong to one or more more societies. But I want to talk about this here. The appointment of scouts. So here. There's a couple places for you. There's one here. You know about scouts in the old days? What does the word scout mean in English? Not a Boy Scout or Girl Scout. But in a, for us, what, what, do, what do you think it meant? What does to scout mean? To go out and look. And what were they looking at? There were Buffalo Scouts to go out and they looked at what our enemies were doing. 
And sometimes those people, in every case, they worked alone. They would go out alone. Sometimes they would go out in groups, but most of the time they worked out alone. So and they would have to live off the land and be away from home and family for days and weeks at a time. And they would come home with information. They were reported to the military and civilian leaders. This is what's happening with the Crow. This is what's going on with the, with the Arikara. Or those kind of circumstances. And not only were they eyes and ears, these scouts, and we don't pay much attention to this aspect of our culture. A lot of that information has been lost. These were the best, most well-trained warriors that we had. Pardon my English again, but these were the badasses. These were the guys you didn't want to meet in the dark alley. And if you could characterize it as such, and I do, these were the Green Berets. These were the Marine Recon. These were the Navy SEALs for us. They were that kind of individuals. They were trained that well. They functioned as such. And so it was this, the military leader's job to send these scouts out and always look at the enemy. So he had to be able to function. He had to be able to hide himself. He had to know what was required of a scout. And one of the philosophies of a scout was you never looked at an enemy for very long because the eyes have the power to draw the eyes. In other words, you felt somebody staring at you, right, sometimes? You feel somebody, somebody's gaze. Well, those scouts didn't do that. They would look and look away just to get a glimpse of what they were, some idea. But they didn't stare at anybody because eventually somebody's going to feel that. So they knew little things like that. And the symbol that they were entitled to use on their shields, on their clothing, on their bows and arrows, on their weapons, were three yellow horizontal lines. That was a sign of the scout. And not anybody could say, oh, I'm going to use these lines today to decorate my shirt. You had to be a scout first. You had to have been trained as such and allowed to do that. One good thing about our society today is there are still medicine men among us. I'm grateful for that. And they were important in a different way back in those days in that they would influence on in the leadership hierarchy. Because there were men of experience, usually older men, men with insight, men who prayed, men who were aware of everything, not just the natural environment, but beyond it. That's why their insight, that, that's why their advice was, was valuable. Experience is a good thing. Any questions so far? Right. Why do we not have our medicine men during their ceremonies during the day? During the day. Because of what was going on from about 1900 to even in the, into the 40s and 50s, when, um, to put it bluntly, the Catholic Church in concert with the government, especially here on the Lakota reservations, were actively after medicine men. They were trying to stop them from doing what they were doing. And when the a Catholic priest, for example, heard there was a ceremony happening at such and such a place, he would send the Indian police out and raid them and confiscate their things. So after that happened for a while, then the medicine men said, well, let's go hide someplace and do it. Strangely enough, when I was a boy of five or six, before I went away to school, I remember helping when, when I forget his name, he was from the north, a medicine man wanted to do a ceremony, but we went west of White River. There's a place called Twin Buttes. You've seen them from, you've seen from the road, those two, Twin Buttes. Went west of there in this little valley of a creek, 
and they did their ceremony down there and he, they placed us boys around to watch for anybody coming so that's what they were doing and that's why they started doing it at night so they could hide so they could hide what they were doing to avoid being taken to jail to avoid having their stuff taken away It can. Sometimes it is. Can it be through adoption? Um, it depends on who's passing it down. A medicine, being a medicine man, as far as I understand it, is a calling. The spirits call you. They see something about you, and they say, you're, you're going to be this. A lot of people who have that, that they know they're being called, they don't want to be a medicine man. I've never talked to a medicine man who says, I'm really glad I'm a medicine man. They say, I wish this didn't have to happen to me. So it's not, an, it's not a career choice. But sometimes medicine men will see something about a young person and try to teach them, to educate them about what it's about. And there's a, this very exhaustive apprenticeship process that is used often. I have a nephew who's a medicine man. He's been a medicine man for 35 years now. And when he was young, that's what happened to him. The several medicine men knew that he was going to be called. So they began to teach him certain things, educate him, bring him into ceremonies, have him do the sun dance. And later on, he had a dream. He was an elk dreamer, for those of you who know what that is. It's not an easy life, to put it mildly. Because you know what, in the old days, what a medicine man did? My, one of my great-grandfathers, two of them actually, were medicine men. <clears throat> and one, my one grandfather, his name was White, uh, Good Voice Eagle. And he died young. Sometimes medicine men will play, a lot of times, they will pray to take the, the affliction or the problem of the person they're helping onto themselves. So that's why it's not an easy life. My nephew, the medicine man, has a lot of health issues. Serious health issues because of that. So they earned their stripes, so to speak. That's why their insight was valuable. They lived in two worlds. And they do. They live in two worlds. Now you can take this for what you want. Those of you who don't know anything about medicine men, or know very little. My nephew lives in Wyoming. I go to visit him every chance I get, mainly to hunt elk, but just to have a visit, spend time with him. And I sleep in a, in a, in a bedroom in the basement underneath where he and his wife sleep. <clears throat> and sometimes at night, I can hear the spirits coming in. Because they come in through where I'm sleeping. And then they go up to him. And I hear him waking up and going outside, even when it's cold. He'll take his robe and he'll sit out there and he'll talk to him. And I can hear voices. And there are a couple times when one of them slapped me on the face. <laughs> Scared the bejesus out of me. <laughs> so, they're, they're critical, and I'm glad we, we have our medicine men today. We'd be a lot worse off if we didn't. And they're the ones who carry their prayers from back then too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's right. All the songs and all the ceremonies. Yep. And so the ultimate responsibility rests with these old guys. And just because I'm not saying so, just because it's not up here, it's not without the influence of women. Because the women had a lot of influence. Who do you suppose all these guys checked with or spoke to when things were getting rough or they had to make an important decision or do something that was critical? Who do you think they talked to? Their wives, their grandmas, their aunties. So women were not out of the picture. They were just very cool in how they controlled everything. 
wasn't very obvious. I can still remember my, either my grandmas just looking at me saying, well, I don't think you should do that. So, they were the ultimate authority or responsibility. And, and here's how it would usually happen. Say there was a situation that needed, a problem arose. Whatever it might be, the buffalo moving off or something. And people had to know what to do about it, what to think about it. So somebody went to this, this old, these old men and they said, this is what's happening. What can we do about it? So these old guys would meet and there was usually one guy in charge. He was sort of, he ran the meetings and he was the, considered the trancha. They talk about this problem that was brought to them. Sometimes for days and days and days. And everybody would have a say. So imagine all of us here, if we were that, all of us here were the council. And say the youngest of us was 60 years old. How many of us are in here? 30, 40? Let's say 40. Let's multiply 40 by 60 and what do we get? Is there a math major in here? <laughs> Come on. What's 40 by 60? 2,400, right? <coughs> That's how many years of experience we would have if we were the elder council of elders. So imagine bringing that to talk about a problem, to talk about an issue. And everybody had a say, if they wanted. And when they had talked it through, and when they had come to a conclusion or conclusions, then they would call in the Eapaha, the man who would go out and announce things to the village. And they would tell him what they had decided. And he would sit and listen. He had to get it word for word. That was his job. Then he would go out in the village and announce, this is what the elders, this is what the old men have decided we should do. This is what they advise us to do. But those old men, that gathering of old men, never actually told anybody what to do. They simply said, this is what we think. And again, because individual choice was important, then the people could decide to follow that advice or not. But ultimately, it was these guys' responsibilities. And what did you have to do to, to join this group? Get old. <laughs> but have some knowledge, have some experience. Be a humble person. My brothers-in-law would never sit on the council. Some of you understand why I'm, yeah, right. This, I'm just teasing my brothers-in-law. <laughs> Not that they're here, but it's a way for me to tease them. Because they tease me too, we tease each other. That's the way it works. I would never tease my ma mother-in-law or father-in-law, but I would tease my sisters-in-law and my brothers-in-law. In fact, I, I, one of my Lakota names is because of my brothers-in-law. My name is Trahanku Shikshiche. Some of you probably kind of know what that means. I like to think it means he who has ugly brothers-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> now remember, my brothers-in-law are not just the husbands of my sisters. They're the husbands of my female cousins. Remember how that kinship system works? So I have a whole reservation full of brothers-in-law. One day they're going to gang up on me. <laughs> but what does it really mean? What does it really mean? Yeah. He who has bad brothers-in-law. Tahanku <laughs> <laughs> is brothers-in-law. Shikshiche is mean they're bad as a group. <laughs> and they know it. So, any questions up to this point?
Okay, shall we get started again, please? Thank you. Any, uh, any questions or comments about whatever we've talked about so far? Um, it's become a custom for medicine men to do it at night. And I've never heard, I haven't heard, I don't know that many, I know few, but I never heard any one of them even say that they want to go back to doing it during the daytime. It's become a part of the tradition now. Yeah, that's true. They wait till dark. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in the old days, see, we didn't have to worry about that. So I think you're right. Yeah, it's it's a circumstance of right now, too. It's more convenient. It's sure is convenient. <coughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, it did. it did. Same basic principle, but there's some variances. Any other questions? Did the women have their own societies? They sure did. There were women's societies. All kinds of them. Around cooling, stuff like that. Did they have warrior women? Yeah, they had warrior women. You, you know about the... Uh, You know about the, the battle that's called where the girl saved her brother? You've heard about that battle? Where the girl saved her brother? And there probably were anywhere from half a dozen to a dozen women fighting at Little Bighorn with their husbands, their sons. I wouldn't mess with those women at all. But, but the, the battle where the girl saved her brother was, in history books, is called the Battle of the Rosebud. It happened on June 17th, 1876, eight days before the Battle of the Little Bighorn. The crazy horse took about four to 500 fighting men. He started out, and, and, and we're getting ahead of ourselves with this story, but again, it tell, it's a, it's a, insight into the kind of leader he was and the influence that he had. Scouts came and reported, this is when, this was in 1876 on the way to Little Bighorn, or Greasy Grass. They were some miles west, probably 20 or so miles west of the Little Bighorn, on a creek called Ash Creek. On the maps today, it's called Reno Creek. Well, she just put their own imprint on it. Scouts came back and reported to Crazy Horse because he was the primary military leader. Sitting Bull was the primary civilian leader for all this, and the encampment was probably about, at that point, six to 8,000 people. They reported an army column coming from the south, and it happened to be General Crook's column out of Fort Fetterman near where Douglas, Wyoming is now. General uh, George Crook. So Brigadier General, he had a force of a 1,000 soldiers, a mixture of infantry and cavalry, and 300 Shoshone and Crow warriors. So he had a force of 1,300. And that was reported to Crazy Horse. So this is one of the few times he spoke in public. He asked the old men to gather. They did. He went, stood in front of them and said, the scouts told me there's long knives coming from the south and they're getting close. I'm going to go and see about them and fight them if I have to, or something along those lines. And he said, whoever wants to can come. 
just like that. Duachianti Mahakab Up Oki. Whoever wants to can follow me. And and when he said that, then he went to his house, his own lodge, got his weapons, got his war horse, hugged his wife, got on his horse, and started riding around the village. This was an old ceremony called gathering the warriors. It hadn't been done in a long time. But he knew about it. And this was a big village. Probably about a quarter of a mile across from one end to the next. Keep in mind there's six to eight thousand people. Lots of lots of teepees. So he went from the opening to the east and he circled around sunwise four times. And people say he did not once look back. But each circle he made, more and more men got in behind him. And this was at dusk. So by the time he completed the fourth circle and headed south to where the soldiers were, he had four to five hundred guys riding behind him. And all he said was, whoever wants to come can come. He didn't say, all right, you guys get off your butts and come with me. He didn't issue an order or a directive. He just said, if you want to come, come join me. We're going to go see about these washichus. History books like to say <clears throat> that we always outnumbered the soldiers. That's not true. If you, if you do research, the number that always comes up is we're 2,000 warriors here, 2,000 warriors here, 2,000 here. There's always that number for some reason. But in, I mean, in combat, how do you have the time to count? When somebody is shooting at you, you can say, well, hold it, I'm going to count to one, two. <laughs> There just isn't the opportunity to do that. But there were about four or five hundred. Like it probably did. <laughs> it certainly did, yeah. You're, you're probably right. <laughs> yeah, it probably felt like that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it, it sounds... Yeah, it sounds better to say, well, there are 2,000 of them and only four of us. <laughs> anyway... They rode through the night. Can you imagine riding one horse, leading another through the night? It was a moonless night. They knew the country, so they sort of knew where they were going. When they got to where the Crooks encampment was, their scouts saw them. And they opened fire and the battle started. It lasted all day into the middle of the afternoon. And they were fighting a, a bigger force, but they were scattered all over. So this girl, and probably several others, had ridden with her brother. There were probably more, more than just her as a, a woman. She was Cheyenne. Uh, I forget what the brother's name was at the moment, but her name was Buffalo Calf Road. Probably not even 20. Somewhere during the fighting, her brother's horse was killed, shot, killed. He fell. And he was caught in a crossfire between two groups of long knives shooting at him. So she rides in the middle of that crossfire to him, slides her horse to a stop, and he gets on the back of her horse and they ride out together while the soldiers are shooting at him. That's a pretty gutsy thing to do. So that's why the battle is called where the girl saved her brother. That happened on June 17th. So there are two really cool things. I mean, combat is never cool. I don't care what anybody says. There's no glory in it. But two really neat things happen. The gathering of warriors, that Crazy Horse did. Because he didn't know how many guys were going to follow him. For all he knew, it would have been six. And then what the girl did. Those are hero stories. Those are hero stories that need to be passed on. So, shall we proceed? Any other questions? So they both lived as they rode away? Yeah, they both lived. They both survived. And as a matter of fact, the day that 
the Seventh Cavalry attacked the village when they got to Little Bighorn that day. Crazy Horse was taking a horse and an eagle feather to the Cheyenne camp to give as a gift to that girl. So he was acknowledging her, her bravery. There were times when things happened when <clears throat> there had to be more, sort of more control, more organization. Not for long periods of time, not for all the time. Like in a, when a village was moving, or when there was a buffalo hunt, or when there was a ceremony like a sun dance, when things had to be more organized and done more precisely. That's when any kind of government, if there was such a thing as a government, that's when it took over. All it was is simply a more organized way of doing things. So several groups of men then were put in control. The first group was called Wakichunze. And it simply means someone who issues instructions, gives orders, usually from the Council of Old Men, who would pass on instructions or orders to, to the people. And these were up to four in a village or in a community. Again, that number four, the sacred number. And these were not just anybody. They were, pe they were people who, who were experienced, who had common sense, had good standing in the community, were respected. So people would listen to them when he talked. Wakichunza. Um, let me mention this now. If, if there's a sign-up sheet, if you would like a copy of these this PowerPoint, let me know and I'll see what I can do about getting it printed for you later on. But don't stop writing. That's not, that's not permission for you to stop writing. I might do that, who knows. So Wakichunza, they were part of the, the governing in, a certain, in certain circumstances. And another group was called the Nacha, or the Nacha. And there was, that means simply a leader, or a group of leaders that were called upon in certain circumstances. And they were always there. If they had done it before, they were available to do it again. But they had a slightly different responsibility. They were sort of in charge of what was going on all the time, about keeping track of it, knowing where the enemies were, knowing where the buffalo were, that kind of stuff. And if there are any problems, then it was your job to think of ways to mitigate it. And they, did, they had a very special responsibility. These nachas, or nachas, selected a group of young men called the uh, Wicha Yatampicha. The last phrase, the Wicha Yatampicha. Anybody know what that means? Wicha we know is men, male, young men. What does Yatampicha mean? Anybody know? It means praiseworthy. Men who are praiseworthy, and there's a reason for that. I'll let you know in a few minutes. So these guys would take control, the Wakichunza and the Nacha. And then these guys, the Akichita. They were the enforcers or the protectors, kind of like policemen. If you want to use that as an example, they were sort of like policemen. But for example, when a whole village was moving, and there are, all, there are all these horses and people and kids running around all over the place. Somebody had to keep order. Somebody had to protect people while they were moving. That was their job. And they were usually younger men, younger warriors. Or a whole warrior society or more than one warrior society sometimes was selected to do that during the village movement or during a buffalo hunt. That was their job. 
Now, there, there's been some confusion over this word, akichita. Today, it's evolved to mean somebody who is in the service, somebody who is serving on active duty, be it the Navy, the Army, the Marine Corps, whatever, Air Force. And people are beginning to confuse the word akichita with warrior or zuya wichasha. They're not the same. I'm sure the guy who functioned as an akichita in these circumstances was a warrior, was a fighting man. But today, I mean, we have to remember those words mean two different things. Akichita does not mean warrior. I've had arguments with people who say, yes, it does. Because my son served in the army and he was an Akichita, therefore he was a warrior. Maybe in a broad sense, especially if you see combat. But in the old days, there was a distinction. Being an Akichita was just for a short duration of time. A warrior was a warrior all the time. Two different things. So it's okay to be an Akichita today. Just be aware of the, the slight difference in meaning. Now here we have the Wicha Yatampicha. Someone worthy of praise. And they were selected, usually four, every four years. And they were also called shirt men or shirt wearers. Vichaya Tampicha. And they weren't so much performing tasks like the Akichita were, or the Nacha did, or the Wakichuza did. That was not why they were selected. But they were leaders nonetheless. And I'll explain it to you in a bit. Crazy Horse was one of these individuals. He was a Wicha Yatampicha. Or a shirt man. The, the common thing is to call him a shirt man. Because of why? A shirt. These, he and four others were picked in, in the last known ceremony among the Oglala to pick these guys was in 1865 or thereabouts. It hasn't happened since. So that was probably the last time it happened. Even if it were hap to happen today, it wouldn't have the same meaning. But this was, as far as we know, the last time it ever happened. Somewhere in Wyoming. Because that's where the Oglala were. So why, why were these guys picked? They were picked because they had a good reputation. They were on the rise as leaders. They were beginning to form uh, a reputation as a good fighting man, as a good hunter, as a good person with a good standing in a community. But more important, they had a lot of potential to be a leader, to be a good man. So that's why they were picked. And people would say, well, pick this man or pick this man. They would say, well, this young man is a good man. Pick him. But it was a Nacha who decided who they ultimately picked. Every four years. So it couldn't be just anybody. It couldn't be my brothers-in-law. You know that. So once they were picked, <coughs> and... The people decided who they were, then shirts were made for them. And then there was a ceremony. But these, these shirts were made out of bighorn sheep hide. Tan bighorn sheep hide. Six of them, six shirts, or six hides. One for the front, one for the back, two for each sleeve. And each shirt was decorated specifically to represent that man. Whatever colors he liked, whatever colors his family decided to use. And there were locks of hair on the shirt, not scalps, but locks of hair from the female members of his family, that man's family. So each 
cousin, the moms, the grandmas, the aunties would donate a lock of hair. And each lock of hair represented a significant accomplishment that that young man had attained up to that point in his life. So they weren't scalps. It was said the shirt that was made for Crazy Horse had about a hundred locks of hair. Across his chest, down the sleeves, and on the back. So you can see what kind of stuff he achieved even at a very young age in his early 20s. At this point he was probably 21, 22, somewhere in there. And these individuals were very important because they had a very special role to fulfill. Interestingly enough, when the Nachas approached him and said, you have been selected to be a shirt man, he said, no, heck, not me. I don't want that. Because he knew what it was all about. He said, no, 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 heck no. Go away. I don't want it. Or words to that effect. Or he probably said, do any. No way. But his dad talked him into it. And this is why. This is what they had to be and do. And imagine a big ceremony, you know, where there's food and there's, there's later on there would be a dance and a lot of talking. And all these guys were put in the middle of the village, in the middle of all this going on. They were put on elk hide robes so everybody could see them to know who they are. Everybody knew them. And then an old man would get up and say this to them. To wear the shirts, you must be a man apart from the ordinary. You must help others before you think of yourselves. Help the widows and those who have little to wear and to eat and have no one to help them or speak for them. That's kind of cool, isn't it? This is what was expected. This is what was expected of everybody, obviously. But these young men were picked to do this as an example for everybody else for the rest of their lives. Would you want that responsibility? And the reason they were called Wichaya Dampicha is they wanted to, they, they were obligated to live a life that was worthy of praise. So people would look up to them as examples. I, I wouldn't want to be that, have that responsibility. I make mistakes all the time. I don't want to be scrutinized every day of my life. And that's what they were. Do not look down on others. What does that mean? Do not look down on others. Don't judge people. Don't belittle them. Don't ridicule them. Don't bully them. Do not let, any, or, or see those who look down on you. What does that mean? Somebody calls you a twerp, you ignore it. And do not let anger guide your mind or your heart. Keep your cool in any situation. Is that good advice? Sure it is, for everybody. And be generous, be wise, and show fortitude. What's fortitude? Kind of a quiet strength. Be strong quietly. Be generous, be wise, and show fortitude so that the people can follow what you do. And then what you say. So these people who were appointed to us, everybody is watching them, so they have to do the right thing. So they could be an example for everybody else. That's why this last line is important. So that people can see what you do. 
and only after you've done and you've proven yourself, then people will begin to listen to what you have to say. There are a lot of people who talk to talk, but they can't walk to walk. It should be the other way around. You walk to walk, and then you talk to talk. Right? That's what these guys had to do. So that's why Crazy Horse didn't want any of this. But he, he gave in, and he did. He gave into it. You want to be a shirt man? Or a shirt woman? Was the responsibilities for the women exactly? Yeah. See? Every, this, this was something everybody had to do. Everybody had to aspire to. But these guys were the ones who set the standard, where they're expected to. I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to do that. I wouldn't want to be given that responsibility. I would never be selected, but if it was offered to me, I'd say, heck no. I don't want it. But. If you think about it, though, they're already living like that. Yeah. That's what, the, yeah, exactly. They were selected because they were already doing this kind of thing. Right. Then it just yeah. kind of becomes official. Yeah. Once they put that shirt on, I mean, that's it for life. Crazy Horse gave up his shirt later. You know the story of that? Crazy Horse gave up his shirt later, a couple, three years later, because remember the girl he wanted to marry and was married off to someone else? She divorced her husband in the way Lakota women were able to divorce in those days. She put all his belongings outside the teepee. <laughs> Sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if she burned them, but she put them outside. His name was his name was No Water. Her, her uh, black buffalo woman's husband was named No Water, because she she had never forgotten about Crazy Horse, because they were childhood sweethearts, and they ran away together. Black buffalo woman and Crazy Horse took off somewhere, but No Water couldn't let her be, so he followed them, and he found them. And he walked into the lodge and shot Crazy Horse in the face with a handgun. 32 caliber gun. Shot him right here and a bullet came out this way. He almost died. She went back to her husband just so to protect him, quiet things down. Because uh, obviously when something like this happens, all the factions emerge. People want to fight right away. She did that to avoid bloodshed. He went back to her husband. Took a long time for Crazy Horse to recover. That was a serious wound. Shot in the face, come out over here. Broke the back part of his jaw. He had a scar the rest of his life. After several weeks, he recovered. He was sort of ashamed. And there was talk. Well, you know, he let us down. He didn't live up to what we expected of him. And they were right. And he knew it. So unselfishly, maybe someone would say, no, that church is mine no matter what. Because it was certainly a status symbol to be a shirt man. But he gave it up. He gave it back. I don't know whatever happened to that shirt. Stories don't verify that. But he was sensible enough and humble enough to give it back. Owned up to what he did. So that was sort of an example as well. Even though he made a mistake, he owned up to it. So, we've been talking about different kinds of leaders and their responsibilities, the leadership hierarchy among the Lakota. But how do you get to be a leader? This is how, in those days. You rise to leadership by distinguishing yourself in battle. By developing experience. By building a record of achievement and alliances. What do we mean by alliances?
know your friends. Know people. Who you get along with. Who you know. Their strengths and weaknesses. So are these, except for maybe the first one, are they sensible things for us to do? I mean, battle can mean something else. Working against the pipeline, for example. That's a critical issue. Standing up against that. Doing something to demonstrate that you're opposed to that. Or domestic violence or whatever. Distinguish yourself by doing something and then people notice you. The purpose is people can see what you've done. So when a situation develops, they say, oh yeah, remember that person, remember that woman, remember that man, they did this back then, they did this, they stood up for us, they said this, they went on this walk to demonstrate, they marched here, whatever. And then develop experience. How do you develop experience? You do stuff. Learn lessons, become educated, fail. fail, be involved. That's how you develop experience. We're all of us works in progress, are we not? Is there ever a point where we're going to reach, where we're going to know everything we're ever going to know? Hell no. We're all works in progress. Well, my brothers-in-law will say, yeah. <laughs> but they're right. They're the smartest they'll ever be. They'll never be any smarter. But we're all works in progress. We need to keep developing experience from any age on. Everything we do, good and bad, teaches us something. It teaches us how to do something or how not to do something. It all counts. That's experience. Yeah. It's not good. No. You're right. And over time, you build a record of achievement. Remember the locks of hair on his shirt? Those are all symbols of achievement. Something that he did. Something that people saw that he did. And it didn't always have to be in battle. It could have been the time that he brought an elk back to this old couple and left it on their doorstep. He did that a lot. And gathering wood was a woman's job, but guess what he did? He would always gather wood for the old folks. So over time, people knew him for those things. And he wasn't the only one. Other people were doing the same things. But it's crazy horse we're talking about today. So develop a record of achievement. How long does that take? Years and years and years. It's not going to happen in two weeks or two months or two years or could be two decades or three decades. So guess what you got ahead of you guys? The rest of our life. The rest of your life. Exactly. And build alliances. I don't know. I've learned some pretty rough experiences in one day. That's true. Even in an hour. That's true. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but it could happen again tomorrow. Or this afternoon. <laughs> they say if you don't learn something, it keeps happening again. <laughs> what do we talk about when, about when we say build alliances? What are alliances? Networks. Networks. Just knowing people, right? People you've worked with, gone to school with, been involved in sports with, and you know them, what they're capable of, how they think. That's alliances. I suppose keep them really strong. Too. Yeah, keep them strong. Maintain those alliances. Maintain those contacts. Yep. Because you might need it one day. You might not need each one of those people all the time, but someday you might need somebody to help you out with something. That's what alliances are. You know what the word Lakota and Dakota and Nakota mean? You do? What do they mean? An alliance of friends. 
because two groups of people came together way back when in the lake country of Minnesota probably before 1700, way before 1700 we don't know exactly when two groups of people, one from the east, one from the north and they met and over time became friends we don't know what they called themselves before that but out of that alliance became came the names Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota. And what do those three things represent? Three dialects of a language that evolved out of that alliance. Two different groups and the three dialects three dialects evolved. And there's differences in those dialects. We Lakota, for example, the word for knife is Mila, M I L A. Mila. And for the Nakota and Dakota, it's Isa. It's a whole different word. It means the same thing. So those kind of clues tell you, tell a linguist who studies languages, that at one time there were broad differences, but then they merged into one parent language. And fluent Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota speakers understand one another. I was in Lake Andes the other day, and one of my former students from way back when, when I taught at the university, Faith Spotted Eagle, is a D speaker. She spoke in D, I spoke in L, but we understood what we were saying. Nobody else did. So, are these things, can we use them today? Do you necessarily have to be a leader to use these things? No. They're a good idea to just to be part of you, who and what you are, depending on what you're doing with your life, what, what you're involved with. <coughs> just good common sense. So, we're going to take a lunch break in a little bit, I think. There's good lunch going to be served. We have a lot more material to cover, so we're going to start with, in studying the life of Crazy Horse, of course, nothing is documented, at least not on our side. Mashichas well, think they've documented his knife, life, but they really haven't. When, I, when you study his life, and maybe other people will come to different conclusions than I have, but I looked at him as a leader, and because I was curious about what made him work as a leader. What was it that worked for him? What made him such an effective leader? Even at a very young age, he achieved leadership status that it took others 30 and 40 years to achieve. By the time he was in his mid-20s, he was a significant military leader and a civilian leader as well. Very few people fulfill both civilian and military leadership. He was one of the few who did. Sidney Bull was one of the others. What enabled him to do that? That's the question I had. And I looked at how he was raised, the influence of his family. Remember that circle I showed you? That how all had an impact on him. And not just on him, everybody in those days, men and women, boys and girls, were given the same opportunity. But there were differences where he was concerned. So I was able to see four things about his record as a leadership as a leader that were important that are important to me that I think can be important to other people and I've written a book about it it's called the power of four I'm not espousing you go and buy it I'm just saying it's there that's the reason I wrote the book is because I, I tried to study the leadership record of crazy horse so we'll start with the first one before lunch I don't know about you, but I'm hungry. And the first one is this. Know yourself. What the heck does that mean? Know yourself. Just that. Be honest with yourself about you. How you think, how you do things, 
what pisses you off, what makes you happy. Know yourself. You don't have to tell the world, but be honest with yourself about yourself. <coughs> My wife and I moved down to Santa Fe in 2001. And <clears throat> there's a street in Santa Fe called, oh, there's, there's all kinds of galleries, Canyon Road. There's all kinds of art galleries on it. I don't know if you, anybody of you have been there. All kinds of art galleries. And on Canyon Road is a restaurant and bar called El Faro. It's an old, old building, really low ceilings. It's probably two, three hundred years old, this building. Really good food. One evening, my wife and I went there to have dinner and listen to the live music. We didn't know there was live music. It was really loud in there. And we had a small table in the corner. There were three chairs there. So we took that table. It was one of those high tables. And the third chair was empty. And somewhere in the evening, this young lady came. And it was crowded. So she didn't have a place to sit. She was by herself. She said, may I use your chair? So we said, fine. But it was so loud, we had to shout it to each other to be heard. So she would go out and get a drink and dance and come back and sit down for a while and go again. That went on the whole evening. I don't even know her name. I never asked her name. Young Hispanic lady. And so at one time she came back, got her jacket and her purse, and then she went like this, so we leaned across the table because she had to speak really loud to be heard. I thought she was going to say, I'm such and such, and thanks for letting me use the table. No. She said to us, Wherever you go, there you are. And then she left. Well, she shouted it, because it was, wherever you go, there you are, smiled and left. But you know, the more I thought about it, I mean, my wife and I sort of giggled at each other because, you know, it was sort of a strange thing to happen in the middle of all that. That's a profound truth. Wherever you go, there you are. What does that mean? You don't change. You can't get away from yourself, can you? No. So whatever you see in that mirror, every time you look and see yourself, it's just part of it. The rest of it is inside you. But wherever you go, there you are. You can't get away from yourself. So you better not deny who and what you are. So knowing yourself can be your greatest strength, or if you don't know yourself, it can be a glaring weakness. So it's important. Crazy Horse knew himself. Other people taught him to be aware of himself. That's how he grew up. Other children of his age in the same environment, grew up that way. So that's the first thing. So what is it about knowing yourself that's important in terms of being a leader? Skills and abilities. What can you do? What, you, what are you capable of? What skills do you have? Can you organize people? Can you convince people? Can you talk to people? Whatever it is, be aware of it. And as I said a few minutes ago, we're all of us works in progress, aren't we? So this stuff about yourself is going to grow and be more and more and be different as time goes on. One of the things that I learned back, what, 30 years ago? I don't hardly use anymore, but it's a skill. And it could probably come in handy someday. It did in a couple instances. I learned how to fly an airplane. The reason I learned how to fly airplanes is kind of silly. I'm scared of heights. I have a hard time getting up on step ladders sometimes. So I was working in Yankton at the time, and I was part of a program that I traveled a lot to Nebraska, South Dakota, and North Dakota. <clears throat> and I'd, sometimes I would charter a private plane. And they would fly me 
two reservations and back to Yankton. So the guy who was flying me said, hey, Joe, why don't you learn how to fly an airplane? And you can fly yourself. I said, are you kidding? He said, no, that's a good way for you to get over your fear of heights. It's one thing to sit beside somebody in an airplane when they're in control and you're not, than to be in control of the aircraft. Then it's not so scary. So, you know, he urged me, he kept me at it, so I finally, he taught me how to fly. I did. I learned how to fly an airplane. But the first time I soloed, took the airplane off the ground by myself, I was climbing up, <clears throat> I forgot everything. <laughs> you ever have that happen to you? You can't remember everything? There's a moment, it was, certainly wasn't a senior moment that might happen to me now, but then, <laughs> I just totally forgot everything. Just for a few seconds, I, I panicked. But it all came back. Obviously, because I'm here telling you about it. But it does help to be in control of the aircraft. And at one point, I was learning how to fly, uh, to get an instrument rating, and to fly a twin engine airplane. I have a license to fly a single engine airplane. My son, Mike, Michael, who lives in Albuquerque, when he was a toddler, we went on a trip to uh, Aspen, Colorado from Sioux City, Iowa. And you know how sometimes they'd take the kids up to the cockpit and show them, give them little buttons and stuff. He went traipsing them up there with my daughter, Kira. And he was proud of the fact that his dad was a pilot. So he told the pilot of the airliner, he said, my dad can fly an airplane with one engine. <laughs> so the pilot patted him on the head and said, okay. Well, you tell your dad, if I lose one of these engines, I'll come back and talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> and he, t he came back and told me, Dad, he said. So, you should know what your skills and abilities are, whatever they are. You never know when you might need them. If I fly in one of those puddle jumper airplanes, like between Denver and Pier or Denver and Rapid City, I know that if something went wrong, I could fly that airplane. So I feel pretty good. So what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? I've been telling you about my weaknesses. You haven't been, been paying attention. My brother's-in-law. <laughs> and your experience. Know those things. What are your skills and abilities? What are your weaknesses? Again, you don't have to tell the rest of the world, but you tell yourself. You be honest with yourself. I'll admit to you one of my weaknesses. I'm afraid to talk in front of groups of people. Truly. I sort of have to psych myself up to it. It's never gone away. I was a little bit like Crazy Horse and I was really shy as a kid. When I went to school, I had to learn to speak English, converse in English. It wasn't that I didn't know English entirely. I just couldn't converse. So it took me a while to do that. And it, there was a lot of pressure, and I was punished for getting things wrong. Got my hand slapped with a yardstick. That kind of stuff. Scolded, whatever. So I developed a stutter in English. So then I had to... I had to go to a speech therapist, and not many in those days, in the 50s, to try to learn to get over the stutter. I still stutter in English, if you haven't noticed. It's still there. It's not as bad as it used to be. So I think because of that, I'm a little nervous about getting in front of people. Interestingly, I don't stutter in Lakota. So I know that about myself, though. So I have to deal with it each time. And of course, my brothers-in-law, they're a big weakness. Can't do anything about them, though. <laughs> and I've gone to school. Um, I was a teacher until I realized how much work it was. <laughs> then I looked for other career paths. I've worked in the private sector. I have worked on movies, or written screenplays, had a lot of interesting experiences. It all taught me something about myself, about the world. And all that's part of who I am. 
It can give me a certain amount of confidence. Or it can put me in my place. But no matter at what point you are in your life, how old you are, don't think you know it all. Nobody ever knows it all. So my grandpa said to me when he was teaching me how to make a bow, <clears throat> I was feeling pretty proud of myself. And he said, hey, remember, he said, I taught you all you know about making bows. But I haven't taught you all I know about making bows. So that's the way life is. You're going to keep learning. Don't ever stop learning. Because you're going you're to build up the stuff, your experience. You're going to overcome your weaknesses and develop strength. You might even turn your weakness into a strength. But the bottom line is, be aware of who, be aware of who and what you are and be honest with yourself about it. You don't have to admit it to anybody else. But be sure you're honest with yourself. So we'll end with this self-assessment and hope there's food. Ask yourself these questions. Do I have more strength than weaknesses? Or the other way around. Do I have more strength than weaknesses? Funny enough, the thing that I'm afraid to do, get up in front of people and talk, is one of the things I do okay. So it's kind of a strength. It's just getting there that sometimes is a problem. What is my greatest strength? What is it about me that I can always rely on not to fail me? My wife was my literary agent. Her name was Connie. And literary agents work with publishers. And sometimes some publishers are harder to work with than others. So it takes sort of a thick skin. But Connie wasn't afraid of anybody. She would pick up the phone and call anybody. She wasn't afraid. That was her strength. She was absolutely fearless when it came to that. So because of that fearlessness, she was able to sell the idea for a book to a publisher in New York City. I know because I was there and I heard it. She sold the idea to a publisher and got a financial commitment in five minutes. And the book is called Keep Going. We walked into the appointment, and the lady's name is Patty Giff. She's still a friend. And she, had, she knew we were coming. She gave us coffee, invited us to sit down, and all Patty said was, well, what do you have on your mind? And Connie said, this is what I have on my mind, and told her about the idea. Of, there was no written proposal, nothing. She said, this is what Joe would like to write. This is what I would like him to write. And they talked about it, and five minutes later, she, the woman made her financial offer. Okay, we can do this for this much money. Connie said, no, how about this much money? <laughs> I kid you not. It doesn't always happen that easy, but in that instance it did because Connie was fearless in those situations. She just didn't, wouldn't take no for an answer. So that was her strength. We'll have strengths. What is it? It's up to you to figure out what it is. And what is my greatest weakness? What is your greatest weakness? What is it that I really need to work on to turn it into a strength? What is it I need to overcome? For Crazy Horse, you know what it was? 
his shyness. He really was very shy. But there were all other traits that he had that sort of helped him overcome that. People responded to him, people gravitated to him in spite of that shyness. To some of the old people, that was an endearing quality. But well, for him, it was a weakness. And what values do I demonstrate and live by? What is a value? We'll talk about it later, but just what is a value? Anybody have any idea? The latest bargain at Walmart? <laughs> something that means something to you. That's a good way to put it. Something that is a strength or could be a strength or something you use. For instance, like, say, persistence. Like my wife. Persistence. That's a value. What about respect? Is that a value? Compassion. Love. Courtesy. We all agree, those are values, right? They're good things. And should they be a part of who we are? Should they, those things be a part of how we interact with each other, whether we know anybody or not, whether we know the person we're interacting with or not? Yeah. There are a lot more values than that. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But that should be part of who you are, those values. And if you use them and live by them all the time, people are going to see. Oh, this young lady is very respectful. This young lady or this young man is very persistent. Those kind of things. Those are values. You don't have to be a leader or you don't have to want to be a leader to have and live by those values. But you need to know what it is about yourself, what values you have, or you should learn. Of course, I'm not even going to mention my brothers-in-law when it comes to values. <laughs> we'll get more into values later on. So what's the first principle of leadership? Know yourself. Know yourself. Like that girl said in the bar, wherever you go, there you are. Very important. Any questions? I always get worried when nobody says, OK, I have a question. Either you weren't paying attention or you're scared or don't care. Pardon me? Chewing on what you said. Yeah. Well, good. It's marinating, right? It's marinating, yeah. That's good. That's good. Marinating is good. Percolating is good, too. 